the latter part of the 1980s, interest in Doctor Who had reached rock bottom in BBC management. In 1989, the BBC finally dropped the axe, with the seventh Doctor and Ace walking off into the sunset, not knowing when the next adventure would be. It would be another 16 years before Doctor Who would return to our screens as an ongoing series, but during that time, viewers shared just a single new televised adventure, and the only outing for the Doctor's eighth incarnation. No other episode would have had as long or as troubled a journey to the TV screen as Doctor Who the TV movie. So sit back and enjoy. This is the long and complicated production of Doctor Who the TV movie. Producer John Nathan Turner had finally been given the go-ahead to leave Doctor Who in 1989. With no suitable candidates to produce a new series in-house, a number of interested parties such as Terry Nation, the creator of the Daleks, and Jerry Davis, the co-creator of the Cybermen, came forward with proposals for a Doctor Who feature film. But it was one approach from a young TV executive in the USA, Philip Siegel, who would be the mastermind behind Doctor Who returning to TV. Siegel was a Doctor Who fan since childhood, and led to his passion and obsession with TV. After emigrating to the USA in his late teens, Siegel had pursued a TV career, and by the early 1990s was working on drama development at Columbia Picture Television in Los Angeles. Siegel made inquiries to the BBC and contacted Roger Lawton of BBC Enterprises, the BBC's commercial department. The initial approach from Siegel came just three weeks before what turned out to be Doctor Who's final studio recording on Ghostlight. The beginning of the 1990s was the dawn of independent television production for the BBC. The Conservative government passed the Broadcasting Act of 1990, which forced the BBC to farm out 25% of its output to independent producers. In early 1990, Siegel resigned from Columbia and moved to ABC Network as a programme executive. Roger Lawton put Siegel in touch with Peter Grigin, the head of series and serials and the man who had cancelled Doctor Who, and Mark Shivaz, the head of BBC Drama. They would look at television in the United States that would be potentially available for foreign sales and managed to meet Siegel. But from the BBC's point of view, they found little reason to resurrect a programme they felt had vastly overstayed its welcome. Siegel, however, would remain in contact with Krajine, but Lawton was concerned about a potential Doctor Who series coming after a full-length theatrical release, now being developed by a company called Coast to Coast. However, BBC Enterprises were not interested, and for the BBC, it was a feature film or nothing. The proposed Doctor Who feature film was now attracting great publicity, with Donald Sutherland being favoured to take the lead role. In 1991, Siegel left ABC to join the TV production department of Amblin Entertainment. Amblin was owned by the most famous film director in the world, Steven Spielberg, and would prove a huge boost to Siegel's courting of the BBC. Spielberg was very intrigued by the notion, but back at the BBC, all was not well. In April 1992, Peter Grigine told Siegel that he felt that the series needed a much longer rest than he was willing to give it. While the series may have been the subject of taboo at BBC Television Centre, at BBC Enterprises it was a different story. Doctor Who had made a lot of money for BBC Enterprises, and that money would be funneled back over to the BBC, but the two companies weren't exactly working in conjunction with each other. But that very same year, things started to look up for the series. Alan Yentob was a distinguished documentary maker and had worked his way up through the BBC rank. Yentob had brought Star Trek The Next Generation over to BBC Two and was proving popular with viewers in an early evening slot. Yentob had also commissioned a series of repeats for classic Doctor Who on the same channel in the early 1990s. It seemed like Doctor Who finally had a friend at the higher ups of the BBC for the first time in years. Siegel continued his endeavours of a co-production deal and found a partnership in Peter Wagg, who had set up his own production company. In late 1992, Wagg had a series of meetings that showed promise with Shivaz and James Arnold Baker at BBC Enterprises. As 1993 began, Alan Yentob took over from Jonathan Powell as the controller of BBC One. Speculation began almost immediately that he would oversee Doctor Who's return to TV. Meanwhile, at BBC Enterprises, plans were coming forward for a 30th anniversary special to be known as Lost in the Dark Dimension, the film would have been released straight to video, had all the surviving Doctors return, and Graham Harper would have been in the director's chair. BBC Enterprises figured that this project would help refresh sales for them by putting out a product that was new, but with a recognisable brand attached to it. 
The anniversary was a minor obstacle for Siegel's ambitions, but there was another obstacle to overcome that was even bigger. Greenlight, formerly known as Coast to Coast, had only 30 to 40 days left on their Doctor Who movie contract, and had to be in full production by a certain date. Their plan was to hire Leonard Nimoy and begin filming immediately, which would demonstrate that the project had gone into principal photography. When Siegel informed Nimoy of the company's intentions, Nimoy immediately abandoned the project. In May 1993, Alan Yentob met with Siegel on the set of Sequest, and they discussed the ambitions that they had for Doctor Who. Steven Spielberg also showed up on the set, and began discussions with Alan Yentob as well. Back in London, BBC Enterprises were readying their own 30th anniversary special, unaware of what was happening across the pond. Peter Grigine was approached to produce the project, but was not happy as it felt it was being made on far too short a budget. Fortunately, Alan Yentob decided to invest more money in the project, and secure the rights for Dark Dimension to be screened on BBC television. More good news was on the way. The BBC took the Anglin script a lot more seriously, and Krajine asked for Siegel to be sent a copy of the Dark Dimension script. Unfortunately, Siegel found the script to be awful and embarrassing, and would confuse potential new viewers. After only five weeks of pre-production on the Dark Dimension, the project was officially shut down and abandoned. In the end, Doctor Who fans would get their 30th anniversary special, albeit in the form of a 15-minute sketch for children in need. Siegel continued to push forward his attempts to get a co-production deal, but this would prove to be a huge struggle, and was determined more than ever not to give up. Siegel eventually made his way to London and met with Alan Yentop once again, and agreed to split the co-production costs on half of £50,000 to hire a writer, develop scripts, and create a bible for their own vision of the programme. Meanwhile, at Universal Television, funding the American side of the deal, they assigned one of its own staff writers to the project, John Leakley. Whilst working with Siegel, Leakley prepared a bible for their planned series. Leakley's interest in the series primarily leaned towards Time Lord mythology. The series bible took the form of a document written by Cardinal Barusa on the planet Gallifrey. It told of travels with his grandson, the Doctor, a brave and unpredictable young Time Lord on his quest to find his long-lost father, Ulysses. I have to look for my father. And face your brother. Only then you will take your rightful place. The Bible also offered brief synopsis of a number of Doctor Who serials broadcast in the 1960s and the 1970s. Siegel and Leakley did not intend to pick up where season 26 had left off, but instead wanted to tell the Doctor's story from the very start of his adventure in space and time. Although the basic tenets of the classic Doctor Who series would be adhered to, the programme's mythos would be completely rewritten. It introduced the Doctor and the Master, who were half-brothers and both sons of the lost Time Lord explorer Ulysses, Barusa's son, named after the mythical explorer who was known in Greek as Odysseus, hero of Homer's The Odyssey. When the evil Master became president of the Time Lords upon Barusa's death, the Doctor fled Gallifrey in a rickety old TARDIS to find Ulysses. Barusa's spirit became enmeshed in the TARDIS, enabling to advise his grandson. The Doctor took the TARDIS to the Blue Planet, Earth, his mother's native world, to search for Ulysses. The Bible went on to detail the Doctor's encounter with the Daleks. They were still creations of Davros, but he was murdered by the Master to gain control of the Daleks. These events, clearly inspired by the 1975 serial Genesis of the Daleks, would have formed the bulk of the pilot episode, in which the Doctor discovered a message left by Ulysses disguised in hieroglyphics he found in a relic room in Cairo, Egypt. Various other possible adventures were then detailed, most of which drew, to some extent, on stories from the original series. Many familiar Doctor Who monsters were extensively revised. The Daleks were hideous mutant creatures whose travelling machines, appearing not unlike those from the original series, albeit without a dome region or external appendages, opened up into a spider-like design. The Cybermen, now called Cybes, were marauders whose cybernetic parts were culled from a variety of sources, giving them a patchwork appearance, although they were still vulnerable to gold dust. The Yeti were gentle descendants of the Neanderthals, and the Bible concluded with the last of the Doctor's adventures, in which he located Ulysses and travelled back to Gallifrey to dispose of the Master and become President of the Time Lords. As Leakley fine-tuned his Bible, Siegel was working hard to commission a two-hour TV movie, followed by a minimum of 13-hour long episodes. At this point, Peter Grigine had left the BBC and was succeeded as head of serials by Michael Waring. Waring's assistant, Joe Wright, will continuously report to Michael about the development of the project. With plot and Bible elements being thrown across the Atlantic, one question was still up in the air. Who was going to play the Eighth Doctor? 
Joe Wright was invited to a casting meeting in 1994 with a long list of actors that included Rowan Atkinson, Chris Barry, Sean Bean, Jeremy Brett, Jim Broadbent, Pierce Brosnan, Simon Callow, Peter Capaldi, Martin Clunes, Tim Curry, Timothy Dalton, Rafe Fiennes, Michael Gambon, Hugh Grant, Anthony Head, John Hurt, Eric Idle, Derek Jacobi, Ben Kingsley, Hugh Lowry, Malcolm McDowell, Ian McKellen, Peter O'Toole, Jonathan Price, and Patrick Stewart. On March 9th, auditions were held for several of the shortlisted candidates to play the Doctor, including Anthony Head, Christopher Bowen, and John Sessions. The favourite at this stage was Irish actor Liam Cunningham, but it seemed that he was unavailable. With the casting still uncertain, more ideas continued to be discussed, including Paul McGann, whose brother Mark had auditioned on the 9th. However, he too who had other commitments. Universal, however, were unsure of the idea, as McGann was relatively unknown in the United States. As spring rolled into summer, Leakley completed his first draft of the script, which told of the Doctor's escape from Gallifrey in search of his father. The Doctor would have journeyed to Blitz London and would have met Winston Churchill, and as the script was going through multiple drafts, Amblin was securing Paul McGann as the Doctor. But in September 1994, the project hit a major obstacle. Although Fox and the BBC had both indicated their happiness with Leakley's work, it was Steven Spielberg himself who raised an objection. The renowned director was concerned that Leakley had veered too closely to his own Indiana Jones franchise, and that there was not enough humour. On September the 26th, Spielberg asked Siegel to start again with a completely new writer. This meant that principal photography would be delayed until at least February 1995. Within the week, Siegel had approached Robert De Laurentiis to overhaul Leakley's script. De Laurentiis, who was recommended by Universal, was a veteran writer and producer, and credits included Saint Elsewhere and Alfred Hitchcock Presents. De Laurentiis wanted to make the script more focused and fun. His initial storyline, now called Doctor Who, with a question mark, was submitted on October 7th. Lizzie, a companion from World War II, and a bulldog sidekick named Winston, and the search for the Doctor's father, no longer named Ulysses, was now resolved over the span of the movie, with the actress for an ongoing series change to the Doctor's pursuit of the escape master. Siegel was uneasy about the direction of Dilarantis's work, but agreed that the writer should proceed to a draft script. This was submitted on December 17th, and saw his American companion renamed Jane MacDonald, while Winston was all but eliminated. Of greater concern for the BBC, De Laurentiis had reimagined the Daleks as shape-shifting humanoids. As such, in later drafts, the Daleks were renamed Xenons. The Doctor was also given another companion, an alien creature called Gog, who replaced an ill-fated character named Sherman. Fox had now become very unhappy with the script, and advocated the return to Leakley's final draft. At the start of February 1995, De Laurentiis left Doctor Who, which was now the subject of a funding disagreement between Fox and Universal. Steven Spielberg officially left the project after raising his objections, and would prove to be a crushing blow for Siegel. Nevertheless, in April, the BBC confirmed that the movie was still being co-produced with Universal, and Fox remained on board. Siegel and Peter Wagg next offered the scripting duties to British-born Matthew Jacobs, whose credits included Ruth Rendell Mysteries and the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. This was not Jacob's first brush with Doctor Who. His father Anthony had played Doc Holliday in the 1966 serial The Gunfighters, and the younger Jacobs had been present on the set. When Jacobs began work on May the 5th, it was decided to start afresh, with the material written by Leakley and De Laurentiis largely abandoned and discarded. Mindful of the Fox's network's younger skewing demographics, Walton wanted to avoid elements set in the past, as well as more outlandish alien creatures like the Daleks and the Cybermen. The Master would be retained, in addition to the notion of the Doctor having a human mother. Jacobs wanted to connect the new Doctor Who show more explicitly with the classic series, and suggested depicting the regeneration of Sylvester McCoy's seventh Doctor into the new eighth Doctor. Siegel had been resistant to these sorts of linkages earlier in the development process, but now agreed with Jacobs' idea. Bob Greenblatt, head of television series at Fox, saw the TV movie as a backdoor pilot, with the condition of a series being commissioned pending on its success. On May 19th, Jacobs delivered a rough storyline, which began with the Seventh Doctor arriving on modern day Earth, in either San Francisco or New Orleans. However, the Dying Master had transmogrified himself into a shape-shifting slick of DNA, and attacked the Doctor, mortally wounding him. The Doctor's body was found by a street kid named Jack, 
Jack brought the Doctor to the hospital where he was operated on unsuccessfully by Dr Kelly Grace, playing on the name of the rear widow actress Grace Kelly. In the morgue, the Doctor would regenerate, and meanwhile the Master acquired a temporary human host body. Jack gained access to the TARDIS using gloves he pilfered from the Doctor's body. The Master raised Jack's father from the dead, and through him compelled Jack to take over the TARDIS. As Halloween approached, the Master used the TARDIS to unleash an army of the dead. With Kelly's help, the Doctor returned to the TARDIS and drew himself, the Master, Kelly, Jack and the Dead into another dimension. He defeated the Master, returned Jack to Earth and left with Kelly. Various changes were made by the time of the next draft on June 27th. The setting was shifted to the days leading up to New Year's Eve instead of Halloween and San Francisco was specified as the location. After regenerating, the Doctor saw a vision of his mother. Jack used the TARDIS key instead of a pair of gloves to enter the time machine. In addition to Jack's father, Kelly was also confronted by someone from her past, and an earlier suggestion made by Jacobs that Jack be killed only to be brought back to life by the power of the TARDIS was included. Kelly also reluctantly re remained behind at the end of this version. As Jacobs began writing his first full draft script, Doctor Who lost a key member of its production team when Peter Wagg elected to leave the project to return to his family in London. Nonetheless, Wagg offered to keep in touch with Siegel and lend a hand, albeit remotely, whenever he could. Jacobs submitted his initial draft on July 18th. Jack had become Chang Lee, and the Master's host body acquired a proper identity in the form of a fireman named Bruce. Kelly Grace was now Grace Wilson, and two cartoonish hospital porters whom Jacobs had earlier mentioned were given the names Bill and Ted after the title characters in the time travel comedy movies, which themselves owed no small debt to Doctor Who, and he also introduced at this point a young librarian named Gareth. The idea of the Master's body decaying throughout the story made its first appearance. In this version, he became more reptilian. The Master was also able to control his form, turning his arms into lassoes at one point. The Eye of Harmony was brought into play, serving as the link as the Master's death dimension. Chang Lee now saw his late father, Jimmy Lee, reflected in the eye, and Grace later had a vision of her grandmother. Chang Lee also had an uncle, Sam, who was killed by the Master, this time, after all four passed through the Eye of Harmony, the Doctor saved Grace and Chang Lee, who was still killed and then resurrected, by embracing his past after conjuring up the ghost of his dead mother. The Master tried to repeat the Doctor's feat, but was destroyed. The Doctor travelled on alone, leaving Grace and Chang Lee in San Francisco. Jacob's next major draft was ready on August 18th. In this version, the Master no longer killed Sam Lee, but instead read his mind, learning that it was Sam who killed Chang Lee's father. The Master's plan was now to channel the emotional upswell of New Year's Eve through the Eye of Harmony, thereby reshaping the universe to his own design, although the Death Dimension was still involved. The appearance towards the end of Jimmy Lee, Grace's grandmother and the Doctor's mother were all excised, and the Doctor's half-human retinal print was now important as the focus of the Master's control over the Death Dimension. The Doctor and the Master now battled around the Eye of Harmony instead of inside it, and at the climax, the Master was sucked down into the Death Dimension. Both Grace and Chang Lee were killed this time around, only to be brought back to life by the Eye of Harmony. As summer wound down, Siegel was hoping to record Doctor Who in November. British Columbia would be the production's base of operation, but some filming in San Francisco was also planned. Rather than launch an ongoing series, Siegel had now come to prefer the idea of regular telefilms, and aspired to make six per year. The notion of remaking old Doctor Who adventures had not entirely been abandoned, but Siegel now felt that a better target was those stories which were no longer held in the BBC archives. At the start of September, Siegel found yet another producer being added to Doctor Who. This time, it was Universal who wanted a representative in the production office, particularly to oversee the project's finances, and appointed Alex Beaton, a, ve a veteran of programmes such as Kung Fu and The Greatest American Hero. To play the Eighth Doctor, the BBC still wanted Paul McGann and vetoed the Fox's network preferred choice of singer and sometime actor Sting. Meanwhile, Jacobs' next significant draft appeared on September the 18th. The Death Dimension was dropped, with the focus of the Master's schemes now an intergalactic roving force field called the Millennium Star, which passed near Earth every thousand years. The Master intended to use the Eye of Harmony to harness the power of the Millennium Star, permitting him to refashion the universe. The Master posed as a fake messiah in order to influence Grace and Chang Lee. The Doctor no longer experienced a vision of his mother shortly after his regeneration. Instead, this was brought about by the Master during their confrontation at the Eye of Harmony. It was at this stage that some of the key crew members started to come aboard, most notably British director Geoffrey Sachs, 
whose work included episodes of Spitting Image, Bergerac and Lovejoy. Sax was recommended to Siegel by Wright when he was unable to hire his original choice, Stuart Gillard, who directed Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Because the movie would be filmed in British Columbia, Canadian regulations meant that the rest of the crew would mostly come from that country. This included production designer Richard Huddlin, whose major task was a new version of the TARDIS console room. Siegel wanted to evoke the Jules Verne's feel of the wood panel set designed by Barry Newbury for use during season 14, but on a much grander scale. It was now planned that the telefilm would air on Fox in mid-May 1996, and this was one of the three key sweep periods for the American networks, the others falling in November and February, when ratings performances determined advertising rates for the next quarter. Consequently, there would be lofty expectations for Doctor Who. Meanwhile, both Fox and Universal had approved Jacobs' script, leaving only the BBC. Siegel was becoming concerned that further delays on this front might threaten the start of pre-production, and so he arranged a meeting between Jacobs and BBC head of serials Michael Waring on October 4th, out of which several more changes arose. The story now began with the Doctor transporting the Master's remains back to Gallifrey, only to have the Master escape in his snake form. The TARDIS landed on Earth and the Seventh Doctor was inadvertently killed, which was now a result of Chang Li's actions rather than the Master's, and would eventually become a Chinatown gang shootout. Bruce was an ambulance attendant who tended to the Doctor, Chang Li allied with the Master out of sheer greed, and Gareth worked for a company which made technologically advanced clocks. From this, Jacobs wrote a new draft script for November 13th. This introduced the idea of the Master being tried and executed by the Daleks, satisfying BBC's desire to include the iconic monsters in some fashion. Also new was the Doctor needing a beryllium atomic clock from Gareth's workplace, here specified as the Technological Advancement and Research Centre. The clock's inventor was named Professor Wagg, as a tribute to Peter Wagg's involvement in the project. Around the same time, Siegel was facing new struggles with Universal, who was uncomfortable about its share of the project's budget. Fox was responsible for $2.5 million, the BBC for $300,000, and Universal and BBC Worldwide for $2.2 million. Siegel made tentative inquiries to see if Paramount was interested in taking Universal's place in the deal, but they declined. Siegel was on the verge of giving Universal an ultimatum, either fully commit to the project or Siegel search for another production partner. On November 6, messages purporting to be from Siegel appeared in various online Doctor Who forums, suggesting that Universal's reticence had placed the project in jeopardy. The messages pleaded with fans to inundate Universal with letters and calls, and even release Universal President Tom Thayer's phone number. Reportedly, fans then proceeded to bring Tom Thayer's office to a standstill, despite the protests of a Universal employee that the situation had been misunderstood and the project was still going ahead. Finally, on November 27th, the deal was done. 63 months after former producer John Nathan Turner departed from the BBC and had closed the Doctor Who production office, its doors were thrown open again halfway around the world in Burnaby, British Columbia. Siegel, Wright and Beaton would serve as executive producers for the telefilm, while the day-to-day -day production duties fell to Peter V. Ware, who had been a co-producer on Columbo. All the studio material would be shot on a Burnaby soundstage, while location filming was now confined to Vancouver. San Francisco itself would be represented only by stock footage. With production now just weeks away, Jacobs was working on fashioning his scripts into a finished form. The BBC was much more receptive to his November draft, but passed it along to his in-house script editor Craig Dixon for comment. From this came the decision to eliminate the Millennium Star concept, with the Master's focus now simply to take over the Doctor's body. Jacobs produced a draft shooting script on December 29th, by which time most of the narrative elements of the telefilm were finalised. Other small changes eventually made including changing Grace's surname from Wilson to Holloway and eliminating the Bill and Ted reference by giving Bill the new name Pete. Much of Chang Lee's background was lost for timing reasons, with all references to Sam and Jimmy Lee having been dropped. Meanwhile, attention turned to finalising the movie's cast. Sylvester McCoy had already agreed to reprise his role as the Seventh Doctor, fulfilling a promise he had made to himself in 1989 to hand off to a successor in proper fashion. Wright had wanted Fourth Doctor Tom Baker to appear instead, but Siegel was now adamant that the telefilm continue from where the original series had left off. Siegel also briefly considered including a role for Sophie Aldred as Ace, the Seventh Doctor's final companion, but this was vetoed by the BBC. Siegel decided to give the Seventh Doctor a new wardrobe, having long disliked both the umbrella and the question mark pullover, which were hallmarks of his original image. 
Costume designer Jory Woodman composed a new outfit which echoed the earlier version, but appeared much more refined, to Siegel's delight. McCoy would also wear the hat that he had sported throughout his time on Doctor Who. Paul McGann remained Siegel's choice to play the Eighth Doctor, but Fox was still not convinced, and wanted a wider range of options to choose from. Consequently, in December, casting director Beth Heimtenea considered a number of further possibilities, including Alan Davis, Alfred Molina, Julian Sands, Arnold Vosloo, and Peter Weller. Siegel and Sachs had also ranked Harry Von Gorkum highly. He had given his concession regarding the Master. Siegel initially wanted Christopher Lloyd, a choice which met with Fox Network's approval. However, Universal stalled due to concerns over Lloyd's fee, and by the time they gave the deal their consent, Lloyd was no longer available. Heimsenea then drew up a larger list of possible Masters, including many well-known names such as Dan Aykroyd, Richard Dean Anderson, Scott Bakula, James Belushi, Tom Berenger, David Bowie, Steve Buscemi, Dana Carvey, Chevy Chase, Phil Collins, Tim Curry, Timothy Dalton, Matt Dillon, Michael Dorn, Richard Dreyfus, Robert Duvall, Robert Englund, Jonathan Frakes, Matt Frewer, Jeff Goldblum, Dennis Hopper, Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones, Ben Kingsley, Christopher Lee, John Lithgow, John Malkovich, R Rick Moranis, Bill Murray, Leonard Nimoy, Jonathan Price, Martin Sheen, Kevin Spacey, Brent Spiner, Patrick Stewart, John Voigt, Peter Weller, Henry Winkler, and James Wood. In addition to Lloyd, offers were extended to Kyle McClatchen, Malcolm McDowell, and Tom Selleck. In the end, Universal pushed for Eric Roberts, despite the fact that his fee would be greater than what Lloyd had requested. The brother of Pretty Woman star Julia Roberts, Eric Roberts, had been a student at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, where he had watched and enjoyed Doctor Who in the mid-70s. Roberts broke into television as a cast member on the soap opera for Another World and soon moved into film, earning an Academy Award nomination for Runaway Train. His subsequent career had been muted by an addiction to drugs, which Roberts had publicly sworn off in 1995. At Roberts' request, his wife Eliza was given the minor role of Bruce's wife, Miranda. Ultimately, the path of grace went to Daphne Ashbrook, who had grown up as part of a family of actors and dropped out of college to pursue the same profession. Ashbrook had pa parlayed a series of guest appearances in programmes like Knight Rider and The A-Team, and into more regular roles such as Our Family Honour and Falcon Crest. She had recently played the title role in the Melora episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. With the start of principal photography rapidly approaching, the Doctor Who movie still faced a number of hurdles. Sachs had originally been promised a 30-day shoot, but Beaton subsequently curtailed this to only 25 days in order to save money. Finances were also a concern when Siegel discovered that the rights to the familiar Doctor Who theme music were not owned by the BBC, but by Warner and Chapel Music. Universal only reluctantly agreed to pay the hefty fee for its use. The new theme arrangement would be composed by John Debney. Then, on January 7th, McGann arrived to British Columbia sporting a severe haircut he had worn for the TV movie, The One That Had Got Away. Siegel had expected the same wild, overgrown style that McGann had used during his auditions, and instead, hair stylist Julie McAfee had to hastily put together a wig for McGann to wear. Meanwhile, Richard Huddleloin had completed work on the enormous TARDIS set, only a small fraction of which was actually be seen in the finished movie. Enormous detail went into the design, everything from the busts of Rassilon visible in the cloister room to a round old type design on the main doors, which would echo the look of the original console room. Every control on the main console actually did something, and the rotating panels were indicated the current location and era, made numerous references to Doctor Who lore, including the Sensorites, Kraals, Califrax, Argolis, Minusa, and the Sumarans and Sarn. The first recording for the telefilm took place at the start of January, when news reports were taped at the studio of local television station BCTV. Then, on January 10th, McGann was unveiled to the world as the Eighth Doctor. Filming resumed in earnest with the material at Grace's condo, shot at a private residence on Ogden Avenue from January 15th to 17th. The sequence in the park was also completed on the middle day at nearby Haddon Park. Eric Roberts joined the production on the 17th, and unfortunately he found that the outfit created by him in the style of the original master, Roger Delgado, was too restrictive. He was also uncomfortable with the serpentine contact lenses he was supposed to wear, and with the prosthetics which were intended to depict his body's gradual disintegration over the course of the movie. The result was that the effect of Bruce's body wearing out was essentially lost, and it had decided to instead dress Roberts in dark sunglasses and a leather jacket for most of the film. On January 18th and 19th, the Plaza of Nations served as the, the ITAR building, Recording overran so badly on the second day that Sachs had to abandon some elements of the Doctor and Grace's escape because Dawn was already breaking. 
The 22nd was spent on ambulance interiors at the studio in Burnaby. Cast and crew then moved to the telefilm's major location, British Columbia Children's Hospital, where they would remain from January 23rd to 30th for the scenes at Walker General. The production was confined to a wing of the hospital which was slated to be demolished. As such, the heat was turned off, resulting in humid conditions for the cast and crew. The Seventh Doctor's year's delayed regeneration was finally recorded on the 26th. It was back to the studio on January 31st for more ambulance footage, as well as sequences in the TARDIS console room and the areas where the Master's casket was placed. The alley where the TARDIS materialised was actually between East Georgia Street and Union Street, where filming on February 1st and 2nd represented McCoy's final work on Doctor Who. Part of the second was also dedicated to the motorcycle chase on the premises of CN Rail. The next day, the intersection of Keeper Street and Carroll Street was the site of a traffic jam caused by chickens rather than escape steeped cart of circus animals for budget reasons. The last location day for the main unit was February 7th, when the Doctor's farewell to Grace was shot at Andy Livingston Park, unfortunately a missed heavy rain, which caused McGann's wig to frizz rather badly. A second unit completed additional street inserts on Waterfront Road the following day. The remainder of the telefilm was then recorded at the Burnaby soundstage beginning on the 8th, with all of the material in Bruce's apartment together with more shots of the casket area in the TARDIS. The console room was the focus on February 9th, 10th and 12th, with the two latter days also dealing with the remaining ambulance footage. The Master's trial on Scarrow was also completed on the 10th, with Gordon Tipple appearing in long shot as the evil Time Lord. At this point, Tipple was also intended to provide the opening narration, in character as the Master. I do hereby make my last will and testament. I'm to be executed, and thus cruelly deprived of all existence. I ask only that my remains be transported back to my home planet by my rival Time Lord and Nemesis, he who calls himself the Doctor. In fact, February 10th had been a scheduled day off, but Sax's concern about the abbreviated schedule were being borne out. It was now clear that three additional days would have to be tapped on to the end of production, driving up the budget by $170,000. The haste meant that some script problems, such as the question of how the Master had gotten into the TARDIS when he first encountered Chang Li, had to be ignored. Most of the remaining action took place in the cloister room, where filming was now scheduled to occur from February 13th to 20th. Sachs had hoped to have all the Doctors appear in the Eye of Harmony, but could not get clearance to use the images quickly enough. The race against time meant that the director had to simplify Chang Li's death. As scripted, the Master broke his neck when he was hurled across the cloister room. Also taped was additional material in the ITAR stairwell and in the casket area. Principal photography finally wrapped on February 21st, back on the console room set. By now, former Doctor Who script editor Eric Sayward had contacted Siegel with an offer to write for any follow-up series. Post-production saw various trims to the material, such as the loss of the scene where the Master confronted the security guards, who were later found to be slimed, as well as more violence in the shootout, such as Chang Li reloading and returning fire. The Dalek voices, provided by Sax himself, were meant to be in keeping with those heard in the original series, but were changed due to concerns that they weren't sufficiently audible for an American audience. Siegel loaned a rough cut of the movie to Los Angeles-based fan Sean Lyon, organiser of the Gallifrey One conventions and editor of the Outpost Gallifrey website. It was Lyon who caught several dialogue errors, most notably a reference to the Doctor having only 12 lives, rather than the appropriate 13. Siegel also had to deal with various claims for credit from individuals who had worked on earlier stages of the project. Despite the objections of Fox and Universal, Siegel won an agreement for John and Roz Hubbard to be credited in recognition of the fact that they had first brought McGann to his attention. On the other hand, John Leakley's case for producer's credit was rejected, as it would deem that virtually nothing remained of his work. Meanwhile, at the Manopticon 4 convention in early April, Siegel confirmed that the telefilm would now have on-screen title except Doctor Who, but suggested that an appropriate title could be The Enemy Within. The first trailers for Doctor Who began airing on Fox Network on April 12th, during the classic Jose Shung's From Outer Space episode of The X-Files. The movie had its first broadcast on May 12th on, on Central TV out of Edmonton, Alberta. This marked just the third time a Doctor Who story had received its first transmission outside of Britain, following the five Doctors and the final two episodes of Silver Nemesis. 
On May 13th, the telefilm was screened by two other Canadian stations, ASN in Atlantic Canada and Czech in Victoria, British Columbia. May 14th was the day of reckoning for Doctor Who, as the movie was screened on the Fox network at 8pm Eastern Standard Time as part of the Tuesday night movie Strand. Unfortunately, sweet oppositions were fierce, particularly in the form of the Heart and Soul episode of Roseanne on ABC, in which popular character Dan Connor, played by John Goodman, suffered a heart attack. Doctor Who earned only an audience of 5.5 million viewers, placing it joint 75th for the week. These results were far smaller than which Seagull felt was needed to interest Fox in an ongoing series, and nowhere close close to what he had been hoping for. Doctor Who had fallen short of the 11 share average for the Tuesday night movie slot, even before the telefilm received its BBC broadcast. It was already clear that Fox would not be greenlighting another Doctor Who project in any form. When the network's fall 1996 schedule was announced on May 21st, Doctor Who was conspicuous by its absence. For a long time, the British transmission date had been uncertain, with air dates from mid-May to Christmas being bandied about. Finally, it was announced that the movie would air at 8.30pm on May 27th, Bank Holiday Monday, preceded by a video release on May 15th. This massively upset BBC Video, who feared that the close proximity would badly eat into their profits. To make matters worse, the British Board of Film Classification decided that the version of the movie aired in North America deserved a 15 certificate. The main offender was the shootout, the, the British entertainment industry had been treading carefully when it came to depictions of gun violence ever since the March 13th shooting deaths of 16 children and a teacher at a school in Dunblane, Scotland. In order to obtain the 12th certificate that BBC Video wanted, about two minutes worth of edits had to be made, and this delayed the video release until May 22nd, which was closer to the broadcast date. When the telefilm finally emerged, a dedication to the third Doctor John Pertwee had been added to its end. The actor had passed away on May 20th, and the tribute was suggested to Yentob by both Siegel and Kevin Davis, director of the doc to Who documentary 30 Years in the TARDIS. Unlike in North America, the Doctor Who movie was successful in the UK, earning 9 million viewers, although, although this was still about 3 million shy of the BBC's goal. Regardless, without a co-production partner, the BBC was right back where it started. Fox had essentially dismissed the property after it fumbled so badly in the ratings, and Universal had been interested in ensuring that its science fiction series Sliders, which it owned completely, was renewed, rather than supporting Doctor Who. Although Fox maintained for some time that the network might consider re revisiting the property at a later date, such statements were merely lip service. When former Doctor Who writers Pip and Jane Baker contacted Siegel in June to inquire about contributing a script, he acknowledged the unlikelihood that he would be making more Doctor Who. Universal's license for Doctor Who was due to expire at the end of 1996, but they were granted an extension into 1997 by the BBC. Fox was out of the picture entirely by this time, and those responsible for bringing Doctor Who to the network in the first place, such as Trevor Walton, were no longer on staff, and the new regime was simply uninterested in programming instigated by its predecessors. Ultimately, Universal had no luck in attracting any other entity to Doctor Who, and they allowed their option to run out. Except for a comedy skit, The Curse of Fatal Death, which aired as part of the BBC's comic relief charity drive in March 1999, Doctor Who would be absent from the television screen for the rest of the 20th century. In 1998, Philip Siegel briefly entered into discussions with the BBC about the rights to remake the two Dalek feature films from the 1960s, but quickly decided there was little potential in this venture. Soon thereafter, he became heavily involved in producing reality programming, including Storage Wars and Ice Road Truckers, and also directed episodes of sci-fi shows like Andromeda and Mutant X. In 2000, HarperCollins published Doctor Who Regeneration, an account of the making of the TV movie, which Siegel co-wrote with Gary Russell. Eric Roberts continued to maintain a high-profile acting career, with regular roles on programmes such as Heroes and The Young and the Restless, and film appearances including The Dark Knight and The Expendables. Daphne Ashbrook kept a steady profile on television, with her recurring credits including Jag, the OC and Hollywood Heights. She also returned to the world of Doctor Who through multiple appearances in audio plays for Big Finish Productions, beginning with The Next Life in December 2004. However, it would prove to be Paul McGann who would have the most enduring association with Doctor Who, an ironic twist of fate given his initial reticence to commit to the programme for even five years. He continued to make numerous television appearances, including the Horatio Hornblower movies, True Dare Kiss, Jonathan Creek and Luther. On the big screen, McGann could be seen in Fairy Tale, A True Story, and Queen of the Damned, amongst others. 
but it was in 2001 that McGann agreed to reprise the role of the 8th Doctor for Big Finish, with that year's Storm Warning becoming the first of, of dozens of audio plays that he would record. Then in 2013, McGann finally got a second chance to film an appearance as the 8th Doctor, when he was recruited by Doctor Who showrunner Stephen Moffat to make a surprise appearance in The Night of the Doctor, an online prologue to the 50th anniversary special, The Day of the Doctor. The TV movie definitely showed an appetite amongst audiences and executives. The road to the TV movie was long and winding, and the fact that it was ever created in the first place is most certainly worth celebrating. This long production is also a testament to never giving up on your dreams, because they will come true. The road may be hard, but it will be worth it. <laughs>